Hey guys, Alex here. I'm here with Spencer off camera. Hey, say hi to everybody, Spencer. Hey everyone. And Spencer is one of my programmers who helps me build and assist all our clients with the cryptocurrency mining. And we're here today to talk to you about a topic which is very, very important. It's one of the foundations of cryptocurrencies. These are the topics which I think if you can't accomplish an understanding, a thorough understanding of these, you should probably stick to other kinds of investing. Um, now the topic we want to cover today is, Spencer? Hardware wallets. That's right, and we're going to talk about how a hardware wallet differs from a paper wallet, an online wallet, an app wallet, and all those other types of wallets which you've encountered in the past, what it actually is, how they specifically work, and why it's the preferred, the preferred choice for all technically inclined cryptocurrency holders, miners, and investors. So, um, Spencer, I'll let you go ahead and ask me the first question. So, what exactly is a hardware wallet? So, hardware wallets are what we consider a cold storage, generally speaking. A cold storage, I'll start there, this is a wallet which is offline. This means this wallet is only connected to the internet when you want it to be when you give it permission to and when you're doing particular requests. So this wallet remains offline and remains unaccessible by hackers. They aren't able to access your phone, your personal computer, network, or other devices to access it because it has no connection. This is where I think uh, the cold storage wallets uh, differ the most from all other, uh, all other methods of storing your cryptocurrency. So if I were to take uh, t make a say a text file wallet, and then I were to put it on a USB, and then take the USB and delete the files on my computer, is that really is that also a cold storage wallet? No. Um, so there's oh, oh you scared me there. There's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities for vulnerability. There's a lot of opportunities for exploitation with the process which Spencer just suggested. So by copying and pasting that wallet, or by using a website to generate that wallet key and that wallet file, that website could be infected, your computer could be infected, your internet connection could be infected, your router, other devices, your USB stick could be infected. Um, uh, there could be someone monitoring your computer in real time. It, it's, it's literally endless, it's the amount of uh, vulnerabilities. So uh, I would say no, it's not a cold storage wallet. While it would be what's considered an offline wallet, it is still, in a sense, a form of a hot wallet. It's not online connected, but it has been created and is online often, or has been in the online space at one time or another, and it's full, full access form. What that means is that means the private key and the public key the file itself, all these things were made publicly accessible to something that has internet connection. So um, while it remains in cold storage, it, it was never a cold storage wallet because it wasn't created under cold storage conditions. You would have to do that by, by manually syncing the blockchain, creating that offline, and then syncing up that private wallet file yourself using the dev tools for each particular coin which generally can be accessed via the github and we'll refer later to how to do this specifically with the most common coins in other videos but if i delete the wallet file on my computer that means it's really gone right well no it doesn't actually mean it's gone at all in fact it can be recovered from your hard drive um, with ease and because of the nature of cryptocurrency, because of the, uh, the sequences of the private keys, the, the shapes, the way they look, um, there's, the computer viruses are very easy to, e able to spot them. So whenever those wallet files are created and even saved to your computer, that is when those viruses, that's when the attackers, the hackers, the malicious people will access those. But let's take a very common example, like Spencer, for example. So let's say Spencer sets up a 12-card miner for GPU mining cryptocurrency, which we talked about in other chapters. And he creates the wallet on that miner itself. Well, because of the mining software, there are vulnerabilities. For example, Spencer, do you have any remote connection software connected to your miners? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, he does. Now, because he has things like TeamViewer or SSH enabled, that does allow other hackers the ability to access that computer. 
it is not a cold storage computer essentially. So any file that was created on there, because he's mining, his computer might be a target because he's on social media, because people know because of his Twitter account that he's, he's in the crypto sector. He might be a target of one-to-one -one person hacks where someone like me penetrates Spencer's computer remotely via his social media, phishing attempts, pretending to be someone I'm not, many other different methods we could use, ports, port knocking or port scanning. I could try to get physical access to his computer. I could try to convince Spencer to run something which was malicious. But once I have remote access to that computer through a variety of different techniques, I can, I, I as a hacker who would be intentionally uh, targeting uh, people with cryptocurrency, especially mining computers, especially mining computers. What do we say about creating wallets, Spencer? Never do, it on, do your, it on your miner. Never do it on your miner because people know that device is very likely to have wallets created on them. So I would hack, I would hack into your computer. And because you don't use the hard drive space on your miner for anything else, while that sector holding that while, wallet file might have been deleted from the computer, it in fact hasn't been written over. And with the, a simple one click of the button, I can recover all that information remotely send it across the internet and I can claim all that cryptocurrency for myself. It's incredible. Um, so no, even if you delete the wall file. <laughs> you know, some people say, well, what if I print it? What if I print it off, okay? Well, did you know that one of the most, uh, most uh, infected targets in consumers' houses right now are printers? Printers, people don't update their printer securities. Printer vendors don't update to vulnerabilities. They're uh, often Wi-Fi connected these days. They're very, very, very often Wi-Fi connected, and they have backdoor solutions for the technical support, which the the hackers write automated malware software, an automated uh, security exploitation software, which uses those backdoors as a vulnerability. Which so if you were to call the printer support company, that's what gives you access or gives them access. So even printing it, the the viruses are looking for the wallet addresses as they go apart. So now what is a a hardware wallet and why is it different? Well a hardware wallet stores those private keys. Think of it like a passport. Um, think of your hardware wallet like your bank branch. Even if someone steals your credit card and your debit card and your your uh, your SIN number and your your driver's license, if you go to the bank with your passport and you say, "Listen, I'm me. Give me my money. Give me access to my account," the bank stores that information. Well, uh, a hardware wallet is essentially the same thing. It stores all of those private keys and those wallet files that you would normally delete but it creates it in a way using their API that's considered offline. So it's, it, it's only issued at the time of connection uh, upon request. So what does this mean? It basically means that for you, uh, you don't ever have to worry about someone asking for your private keys because the, they're not exposed to you. Um, you don't ever have to worry about someone uh, being hacking your computer while you're using the wallet because the coins the private keys and the wallet files are actually all stored in the USB device itself in the, the hardware wallet. Even the, the coin transactions, you could be essentially using an infected computer at an internet cafe uh, on a vacation in Taiwan. And because of the nature of the hardware wallets, they don't actually have the ability to uh, extract any of those private keys or coins or wallet files from the stick itself. The only way you could then be affected is if um, you copy pasted or you entered the wrong wallet address when you issued that transaction. Um, yeah. So essentially the private key never leaves the wallet. That's why you're secured. That's right. The private keys, the wallet files, these things are always stored in the USB stick itself and it's never made public. So, and, and then the API, which is the word seed, which is created by the wallet, which allows you to recover it if it's ever stolen or damaged. Um, these allow you to get your coins back no matter what. With a new device, you just enter those same words that the, uh, the seed it's called. Uh, that, that allows you to always recover regardless of, uh, of any situation. Uh, so th it is the best solution in my opinion. 
So uh, what are some of the hardware wallets that are available on the market right now? Yeah, so uh, there's a variety of different ones, but there's the two largest competitors right now would be the Trezor and the, the Nano, the Nano Blue and the Nano Ledger S. Um, personally, I have both seen and been a part of the exploits of the Trezor wallet myself. Um, it's due to with the chipset, so if you have physical access to the Trezor, you're able to exploit those private keys unencrypted at a certain point of its boot. So, and the private key, the seed recovery key. So, I suggest all my clients use the Nano Ledger S, which is my preferred device for storing all my cryptocurrencies in cold storage. And why is that? Um, the Nano Ledger, it, it's physically secure. It's, they've shown, they've generally had the best track record. There hasn't been any coins accessed physically from it or uh, remotely from them so far and I think uh, until something changes this would be my best bet and the the, the chips that they use on the nano ledger oh right so Spencer why don't you explain the chip difference so on uh, the nano ledger they actually use the same type of memory that's found in banking and ATM machines so yes. unlike the Trezor wallet where so all these chips are have to be built to a specification that's secure so I, you have less issues with a hardware vulnerability yes and the Trezor the chipsets that are used in the Trezors are actually the same chipsets that are used on the Arduinos and other devices um, not cell phones per se but cell phone like devices um, generic computer devices that it lacks security and upon booting you can actually eject the private information from the Trezor. So this is what Spencer is referring to. Is Nano uses a superior chipset which has been proven in the uh, banking and financial industry in the past. So this is why we like that as a hardware device. Now where should you buy your hardware wallets? We certainly shouldn't buy them from a, a second seller or retailer.